Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I had with Wendy LePage, a research scientist at IDEX Laboratories. IDEX is now a huge multinational corporation, but when Wendy started working for them in the 1990s, they were still very much a small Maine company, one doing incredibly cutting-edge science. I really enjoyed hearing about Wendy's work and appreciate her explaining how R&D for her, in an industry setting, is different in some ways from R&D in an academic research lab. Wendy has been a hands-on presenter at the Maine Science Festival in the past, and I'm delighted that she will be back at the 2024 Maine Science Festival. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and I hope we'll see you at the Science Festival. So, Wendy, welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I am delighted to have you here. You've been a long-time presenter at the Maine Science Festival, which is how we met. And it occurred to me after doing this podcast for as long as I have, I have not had a ton of corporate science researchers so I was like, I know who I can talk to. <laughs> so before I let you talk about what you're doing corporate-wise, I would love to get a little bit of your background and how you ended up in science. You could start from as far back as you would like. Okay. I was definitely that kid in the bathroom making potions. Oh, calamine lotion, alcohol, throw in a cotton ball for texture. That was definitely me. And so I always sort of been interested in the sciences, but never really had a direction. I actually was pre-med in college and said, ooh, that is not for me. (laughs) But if I'm having a bad day, somebody's going to die. And that's not the kind of stuff. I don't want that. And so I really enjoyed the lab classes that I had. And I thought, maybe I could do that. And my sister had a friend that worked here at IDEX. And I got a couple of interviews and I decided that, yeah, I definitely want to be here at IDEX because this is sort of cutting edge science here in Maine. And that's unusual. I thought I might have to go to Boston. And since I'm from here in Maine... It's really a a great place to where I ended up. I was very happy. Were there any particular lab classes? Because one of the things I certainly realized as an undergrad is that, you know, like chemistry lab, I liked physics lab, not so much. So were you drawn to one type of lab experience or did you just kind of like them all? The one with the least calculus? (laughs) It's funny now because I wasn't very good at math in college. I didn't really like it all that much. But once I got into this position and realize that, you know, math with an actual purpose is not that scary because you have an end. Like, how am I going to make this solution? I have these starting ingredients. I need to know how to make this solution. This is math, but it's practical. And so I really liked a lot of the biology classes. I actually had a a major in zoology and a minor in chemistry. So I had my fair share of all of the sciences. I think I took a couple of physics classes, but I really tended to like more of the biologies just because you can see and feel them more so than, you know, to think like an electron takes sort of, you know, like chemistry that takes like a special sort of person. It's funny. The only physics course I really liked was the one where I could imagine all the electrons. Oh, see, there you go. All right. All right. So you got to IDEX and you made my day when you said, You were really glad to find that there's this cutting edge opportunity in Maine, thinking you had to go to Boston. This has been one of my things I've been trying to champion now for, I guess we're moving on 12 years, which is amazing to say out loud, actually. So you're doing my job for me there. I'm curious, you've been at IDEX pretty much your whole professional career? I have now been at IDEX for over 29 years. Awesome. I hope you get something cool with that. I do. I actually get a really great benefit called personal growth leave. So it starts on your 10th anniversary and you get it every five years after that. It's four extra weeks of paid vacation to go off and grow your person, do something you wouldn't normally do. That is fantastic. That is really great and really smart because it just gives you a chance to recharge. Right. And also we have, and I don't, I don't want to be so pro IDEX, but it does fit my lifestyle. They also give every single employee here at IDEX two paid days to go out and volunteer in the community. So that's how we ended up at the Maine Science Technology Fair. All right, so let's dive in. What exactly do you do at IDEX? But before we answer that, maybe a quick background about what IDEX does. We've had, I've spoken with Dave Levine and he gave a really great overview of what he does with IDEX, which I, just knowing what your two backgrounds are, I imagine is quite different than what you do at IDEX. So if you could give a super quick overview of IDEX and then what it is you're doing explicitly. Okay, so IDEX, we are a veterinary biotech company for the most part. We have a couple of different sectors. We have a water testing sector. And what that group does is they make tests that communities use to make sure their water is safe for drinking. So it tests for E. coli, coliforms, things like that. The other parts of IDEX, we sort of divide them up, sort of crass to say, but we divide them up into animals that you eat and animals that you don't eat. 
So we have production animals, chickens and uh, cattle and things like that. And we make tests that veterinarians and even farmers can use to make sure that their animals are healthy so that they're not carrying sickness and they, the farmers don't lose their crop to mad cow disease or anything like that. And then in the companion animal group, we are making and innovating tests that help veterinarians provide a better medicine. And it's really interesting. One thing I didn't really learn before I started at IDEX was that when human medicine is developing techniques and different things like this, they will often use dogs as an example. And so right before we put out our SDMA product for a kidney function, all of a sudden, all of these human practitioners are talking to us and saying, hey, we want to partner with you because you've done all of the pre-work that we would have to do to do the same test in the human market. And so we're partnering on sort of cutting edge science with the human market because we're sort of step one in their process. That's really cool. I did not realize that either. It must be some kind of combination of mammals and how the kidneys in particular, in that case, function. That was really interesting. So that's in a nutshell what IDEX does. Okay. And you? Me specifically. So in my 29 years, I have literally started at the bottom. I was assembling one of our biggest platforms out in the world is the SNAP test. And it's just a little, it's like a COVID test. It's just a little rapid assay test. And I started assembling those pieces all day, hundreds of them. And I started in quality control for these SNAP devices. And then I moved into research and development. And my current role is in BRIC. So BRIC is our Bioanalytical Research and Instrumentation Center. My specific part of it is characterization of raw materials. So when we get raw materials in for a new product, say, we want to be able to measure some kind of characteristic of this material that will tell us whether this is going to work in a product or it's not going to work in a product. Purity, for example, is a, a great one, an easy one. So if we get antibodies that we purchase from an outside vendor, and we bring it in-house and we test it, and we can test various different amounts of purity versus function of the test. And we can say, oh yeah, if it's not 95% pure, it's not gonna work in our test. So we know if we get a lot in from the vendor that's 90% pure, we'll send it back. We can't use this, it's not gonna work. It sounds like you've been consistently in quality control areas. Is that accurate? Yep, well, I started in quality control and then I moved into sort of product development R&D. And quality control is a great place to start because you get part of the manufacturing of it, you get the science of it, and then you really understand what is manufacturable. What can you make reliably each and every time? And it's good to know that before you move into product development so that you know how to make good products before you even start. So do you work on products that cover the three different areas you talked about? Or are you in just one? I am just in one. And most of the time, the people who work, they will stay within their own line of business. There's not a lot of crosstalk between them. They're very different. Well, I figured, I mean, it would be kind of extraordinary to me if you could do all three. I was just curious if that was possible. No, a lot of the livestock is called LPD, livestock, dairy, something. Not your field is my guess, huh? <laughs> we have so many acronyms. It's almost <laughs> embarrassing. So in the other division, the production division, they have very similar products. So a lot of the times we'll use the same platform, for example, that snap test, but the reagents are very different and the samples are very different. So there is a little bit of crosstalk. So there's a basic foundation, but then it diverges. Yeah. And so I'm in the companion animal group. That's dogs. Right. I mean, did you get to pick or is that just where you kind of happen to end up? I actually started in dairy and then I moved into companion animal group. I guess I picked by choosing different positions that I wanted within the company, but it wasn't an active like, ooh, I need to be in companion animal. It was, oh, hey, this group has an opening. I wonder what they do. So it's been leading by the science and the cool stuff you can learn and do with it as opposed to the end product. Correct. All right. So you've been with IDEX for a bit. So you've seen pretty phenomenal growth. Yes. I remember when I first started even just thinking about how I was going to kick off the festival, hardly anyone in Maine had ever even heard of IADX, and they'd probably been around, so that was 2012. It had been a while, but not really well known. I'm curious what it's been like to be part of an organization that arguably for a very long time was seen as a startup and maybe doing cutting edge, but kind of small, and now is truly in anybody's measurement a global leader. 
Absolutely. So just to give you a little bit of context, I am employee number 488 or something like that. And I believe we are now 10,000 worldwide, 10 or maybe even 12. So the growth has been absolutely phenomenal, a whirlwind, to be honest with you. And it's growing and it's adapting different strategies and technologies and, and what are the competitors doing and how can we make products that help veterinarians practice better medicine? What can we do better than we did last time? We are putting out quality product right from the beginning, and we are doing all of the problem mitigating up front, and it has revolutionized, I want to say, the way that we do business, at least in the R&D world. All right. I'm going to make you walk me through what does a day look like or a week or a project look like when you say you're working on research and development? Is it lab work? I assume there's a team of people. What does it look like from kind of start to finish? Start with your day and then we'll go to the project. Okay, so I work on any number of different projects from around the building. For example, I had a set of samples come to me and said, we have these reagents. I have this one is a normal everyday sort of reagent, normal reagent. But this one required us to make an adjustment in the software of like 40%. What's the difference between these two? They both pass all the specs that we have, but what's the difference? And so we have a biointerferometry layer machine, BLI, and we use that to measure antibody and antigen binding. So I tested it on that instrument, and we were able to detect a difference between the good one and the bad one. So oftentimes I'm comparing good and bad samples. Why is this one working, but this one isn't kind of thing? Or like I said before, I'm trying to come up with a measurement that doesn't involve building the material into product to tell us whether it's going to work or not. And we have all of the best toys in the whole building. We have, we have probably 25 different instruments. We have an electron microscope. We have all kinds of really interesting things that we can measure. And so I could be working on any of them or none of them. I could be writing lab reports. I could be sitting in meetings next week. Two weeks from now, I'm going training on one of the instruments that I don't understand very well. It's really a mixed bag. Do you have a favorite machine? I was always partial to mass spectrometer because I just thought it was so cool that you could figure stuff out with that. Well, the latest one that we got is an elemental analysis machine, and you literally blow things up. So you take a very, very small amount of sample, and you wrap it up in a little tin foil ball, and you put it in the instrument, and it goes into this furnace at 1200 C, and it just burns. And all the gas gets blown through another column where it gets floated over some 1200 C carbon, it takes all the water out, and then it goes through a bunch of traps and it collects the carbon, the hydrogen, the sulfur, and the nitrogen. And then after all of the other stuff blows through, then we can analyze those four elements for percentage. And so by knowing how much of these elements is in there, we can understand a little bit about the material itself, but also uh, some of the purity. That is really cool. And I get to blow things up. I mean, that's just an added bonus. That and the electron microscope. Like the first thing we ever looked at in the mic electron microscope, we found a dead spider in the hallway. <laughs> and so we got the electron microscope to look at the spider. But we got way down. We looked at the pores on the skin, the hairs on the hairs on the hairs on the skin. It was cool. I mean, that's kind of the cool thing with one of those microscopes is that you can see it at like literally a granular level. Absolutely. You said you test reagents that come in and things that help your product. Do you guys ever make your own and compare it with other ones or do you rely heavily on the supply chain for that? It is a little bit of both. Some of the more basic, like we're not going to make our own sugar. You know, some of the more basic ones we buy literally by the bucket full. A lot of the more specific reagents, we call them rare reagents. We will make those specific antibodies, specific antigens for a specific test that we are working on. So you have to do the same process with that, right? To make sure the quality control and make sure that's pretty neat action. Those are a lot harder because they are very specific and oftentimes they don't have a lot of volume or mass. And so they're very hard to do analytics on because they are so limited. So that's where it becomes a challenge. You have to sort of think about, okay, what have I got in my tool belt? What's in my arsenal? What out of all of these instruments that I have at my disposal, what would give us the most interesting information? 
Okay, now start to finish on a project. Okay, so these are years long projects, right? And oftentimes they start with the customer and the customer calls up and says, hey, do you have this? Or I would buy this instrument if it had this feature, for example. And then it comes down into the senior managers. And if they get enough interest in, a, say, a project like that, they will investigate it. And then it goes through. We have a phase system. We have five phases of product development. We have the first one is just the concept. Is it going to work? Flesh out the concept a little bit more. What does it mean for the customer? What does it mean for IDAX? So our customer is a veterinarian, but what does it mean for their customer? And then we have feasibility. So this is where a lot of the pre-work gets done. Can we actually do it? And then development, this is where all of the major work happens. And this is where we're mitigating all of those risks with vendors and product supply line and all of those kinds of things, as well as reproducibility, repeatability, all of those kinds of measurements. And then we have validation. So then we're making sure that A, we made the right thing, and B, is it meets all of the stakeholder needs, and B, did we make it right? Is it repeatable when we make it? And then the last one is the transition out into the manufacturing. And every single one of these phases has input from the senior managers and the development team, which is cross-functional. We have a whole group of people who that's all they do is just lead products like this. And so it's a well-oiled machine by now. We've been doing it for so long. We really have the process down rather nicely. So depending on the project, it can be years and years and years or a couple of years, or even I think I worked on a couple of them where we did it in nine months. So do you get to be on projects from start to finish or do you bounce around some? Me personally, no, not anymore. I used to when I was in product development. Yeah. We have a group of people that are sort of focused on the beginning part of like creating those rare reagents because that takes some pretty specialized education and some experience and some instrumentation. And so they will start getting the reagents developed and sort of get that started. And then they'll give it to the new product development team. And then we'll just start the process again. So that's one of the features of getting bigger is that you've got people who can specialize in, like you said, the beginning part and then the middle and then the end, as opposed to the whole thing. Yep, it is. If you become too compartmentalized, though, then you run the risk of not transferring enough information and things get lost in the transfers. So kind of a fine line between wanting to keep it small and have everybody sort of know, but you don't, that's a waste of everybody's time to know everything. So it's very much a balancing act between trying to keep everybody informed and transfer the right amount of information, but not too much or not too little. Okay. I'm going to circle back to one of the first things you said, which was medical doctors for humans. Is that a relatively new thing that you guys get to do? It sounds like it. And is that something that you can imagine you get to keep doing? So this is something that is relatively new. I first heard about it maybe four or five years ago. I don't think it is a new thing for the industry. We have a whole medical affairs team that this is what they do. And KOL is the key opinion leaders in that field. Like, for example, we were starting to launch a kidney health set of tests. And what can we measure? They actually, we had our mass spectroscopy group. They had this whole set of samples that were normal sort of cats and dogs. And remember, everything happens in the human world. We have to do it at least two different times, if not three, because we have different species, cats, dogs, horses, right? And so it's triple. And then you throw in breeds. Like the chemistry of a Great Dane is very different than the chemistry of a Chihuahua. So we take a whole set of samples that from one set of dogs, for example, that are healthy. Then we take another set of samples from dogs that have various stages of kidney disease. And we compare a lot of different biomarkers. And can we find one that is unique to this illness? And then if we do, then we can take that and start to develop it as a rare reagent and try and come up and make a test out of it. Didn't even occur to me that different breeds within the same species would be that different. Oh, very different. And does it fall into at all large dog versus small dog, for example, or is it not even that simple? I'm sure it does. But from my point of view, it is mostly breed driven because some breeds have been inbred too much. And now they're more prone to like hemophilia and other genetic diseases that 
normally would not be so prevalent, but we've caused we've inbred them so much. Now they have tendencies towards these kinds of things. Super interesting. Same thing with horses too. You have your warm horses and your cold horses. Wait, warm horses and cold horses? Sorry, warm blooded and cold blooded. Oh, <laughs> that makes more sense. We have a relatively new kitten at home and we have friends who have dogs and getting them together. And the kitten had something. And one of the first things the vet said to me was, you don't have to worry about getting together with the dog. And I was like, oh, that's really good. It wasn't a big deal for the cat and totally non-existent for the dog is an issue. And so that was kind of the first time I was like, okay, so even though I kind of slot them in the same category, they are really not. They are not. I do a lot of data analysis. Like before, after treatment, you know, what does this population look like? And so inevitably, when we have an outlier sample, it's always a cat because they are so high strung. You get them into the vet and the clinic and they almost all of them just get so nervous and so upset that all of their blood values go wonky. And yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. I don't know how you would possibly fix that either. A lot of the times the vets are mobile, especially equine vets. So they come to you, especially like if you have elderly pets. I had a friend with a very elderly cat and the vet just would come and draw the sample and and do the exam at home. Yeah. So that would be about the only way to kind of ease that up a little bit. Yeah. Or you leave them in the vet's office enough so that they can become calm. Actually, vet's office, oftentimes they'll have like spray pheromones and things like that that will calm the animal down and make them feel a little bit more at ease so that they can do these kinds of tests. All right, I'm going to make you go in the Wayback Machine one more time. With my background research, I saw that you were in the Peace Corps. So I would actually really appreciate hearing about that. What inspired you to do that right after undergrad? And I saw that you were assigned to the forestry group. So it'd be interesting to hear what that experience was like. And did it just help set your path forward after that experience? So I went to undergrad at the University of Vermont. And the Peace Corps has a pretty big presence at the university there. I think they recruit pretty heavily from the University of Vermont. So it was one of those things that I was exposed to and was kind of like, huh, okay. So I thought about it. And then as graduation came closer and closer and I was nowhere near close to getting a job, I thought, okay, this might be a good option, (laughs) right? But, you know, I got a chance to live in a different culture. I had to learn French. From French, I had to learn a local language, right? And it's a two and a half year stint. You know, and I got to do a whole lot of traveling around. And so it was absolutely monumental experience in my life because the whole, the culture difference was so immense. I lived in, in Mali, in West Africa. I was a natural resource management extension agent. So I was a forester essentially, but we had a team out there. It was absolutely monumental. And I didn't know anything about the Muslim religion. And most of my villagers were. And there's also animists. They believe in the the sort of natural religion of the earth. And that was absolutely fascinating. And all of the food. I was very fortunate that I didn't get sick. I had some friends that, well, you always run the risk of Montezuma's revenge in another country, but I didn't get sick. You know, malaria is pretty prevalent there. Peace Corps actually did do some really great work in the area. They got rid of guinea worm. Guinea worm is a horrible, horrible parasite that is debilitating. And all you have to do is filter your water. It's all you have to do. And just filter it through a shirt. But unless you know that, you're not going to do it. So it really was an absolutely fascinating part of my life. It changed me forever, for sure. Did it change the direction of my career? Probably not. I think I was always sort of on the bend of, yeah, I want to do something in the sciences. I don't know what. But it was definitely going to be something in the sciences. But I think it made me stand out as an interviewee, like everybody wanted to hear about what I did in the Peace Corps. Nobody really cared about the science that I did, but it was great. The Peace Corps has three different goals. You have to provide some kind of service or training or education to the host country. Then you have to learn about the host country and take it back to the U.S., And you're also teaching the host country about the U.S. because they have some very fantastic ideas about how we live. Yeah, I think any chance that you have to have an opportunity to live in a culture that is different than your own, you can't help but learn how little you know, number one, but kind of all the ways to, I mean, this sounds stereotypical, but all the ways that you are alike and what does line up. I remain convinced to this day that one of the transformative events for my kids' lives were a year we spent in Ireland. 
culturally in many ways that wasn't vastly different in some ways, but in other ways it was. It changed how they looked at the world and from what I can tell all good ways because it just broadened their experience with different people. Yeah. So now you're not so stuck on this is what normal is. And that's pretty nice. So you enjoyed it and then you were happy to get back. I did. Actually, I have to say that transitioning back home was harder than transitioning into Mali because now, you know, I had gotten used to the culture and I had sort of the ends of the funny jokes or, you know, the cultural jokes and things like this. And I came back to the U.S. and I was like, wow, what is this? I literally stood in the cereal aisle in the grocery store and was so overwhelmed to try and find breakfast cereal. I left. I couldn't make a decision. Wow. That's an immigrant experience right there. Really interesting. All right. One last question to put you on the spot and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Your favorite companion type animal for yourself? Oh, I'm a cat for sure. Although if I had no, if I didn't have a husband, I might have a ferret, but my husband said no to the ferret. I'm with your husband on that one. I got to say. Yeah. Okay. And I now being a little bit older and more real, I really, they, they're not the cleanest of animals, but they are just super neat. They're cool animals. I had gerbils growing up, so they were neat. My husband wants a dog, so we may end up with a dog. I love other people's dogs. I love seeing them for a little bit and hanging out with them. And then it's like being an aunt or an uncle. It's the best. Like you just give the baby back, <laughs> visit with the dog. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Especially since, you know, I'm going on vacation shortly. And, you know, if I had pets, what would I do with them? My next door neighbor that usually takes the pets is coming with us. So I don't know what they're going to do with their pet because I'm not there to take care of it. Okay. I did say that was my last question, but I'm going to circle back one more because I just realized I wanted to ask you about the science festival. And I know that we had talked about, I believe you're coming back this year. We're going to have IDEX there this year, which I'm really, really glad about. It feels like we're finally, truly coming out of the pandemic. I'm assuming you do some of these things because you just get a whole lot of enjoyment out of it, which the fun part of running these events is you get to watch people teach like the position you're in and then the aha moment on the other side, like as, as a casual observer in the background. I'm curious how hard or easy it is for you to know that you could have anyone from a five-year-old to a 55-year-old. How do you talk about it in a way that feels really cool and exciting for both of those groups? Like it is not trivial to do that. It is not. And so what we tend to do is we will pick different activities for the different age groups. Like there's no way that I can explain how one of these snap tests works to a five-year-old. You know, I could get that child to try it because all you do is you add the sample, you mix it, you pour it on there, you wait, you snap it, it comes up. But typically we will do a young age, hands-on. These are all hands-on activities, but this is a little bit more hands-on. Like, I'm not sure if we're doing prisms this year, so we'll do something with light. In years past, we've done something with chromatography. So you color on a coffee filter and you let the water wick it up and it separates the colors. And kids really just want to see something and they want to do it. They don't want to wait for it. So you have to choose something that's not only cool and exciting, but fast. And some of the older adults, like we'll be bringing snap tests this year because it's been a few years since we brought them. And this test will test for antibiotic residues in milk. So if you have a cow with mastitis, you want to give it penicillin, but you don't want that penicillin in your milk because cheesemakers don't like that. Plus, you don't want to become insensitive to penicillin, all these other reasons. And so what we do is for the sort of middle age kids, we just let them run it. You know, we get them to put the glove on and the glasses and right. And everybody loves that. And then we get them to run it. And then the older people and the adults, what we do is we get them to run it. And then while they're waiting for their test. We actually talk about the science like, oh, on this spot, we have this kind of reagent. On this spot, we have, you know, so we get a little bit more of the details of how the architecture of the test works. Where's the flow? How does the flow, when you snap it down, how does the flow then change directions? That's weird, you know? And so we really try and cater it to the different age groups. And it's not necessarily age. I remember I had this young woman who seemed to be about 17 or something like this, and she came in. And she had some developmental challenges and she came in and she was so excited to run this snap test. She literally was jumping up and down, clapping like, this is what I want to do. And she was so happy to be there and she made my whole day. She was just so happy that I could show her this and she could try and she 
played with the pipettes. We bring pipettes. I had one little boy who came over, didn't want to run the test. He wanted to play with the pipette. Okay, let's transfer water from one cup to another cup. I can personally see the meditative part of that that is really soothing. Like you can actually see like I'm doing this. I mean, it's the first step, right? It's the first step of, of thinking about, wait, what is this doing again? So, you know, I always feel like at events like this, that little kid, you grabbed him on something. And at some point he's going to be like, wait, what was I doing? And then he's going to figure it out more and figure it out more. It's almost like the gateway drug into it. Oh, yeah. And there was a series. There were some older gentlemen who were in wheelchairs and we had set up a photo booth that they could come in. And they were so excited to have had their picture taken. We brought a big overstuffed dog with us and we had lab coats and things. And, and they were so excited to have had their picture taken with this dog. We met so many great people and they remembered from like, I didn't see them last time, but the, I think that was my fourth time. So this, I met them on the first time and they remembered me the second and the third time. That is fantastic. So we'll have to see if that streak continues this year. I'll have to catch up with you. Yeah, I didn't see them last year, but I hope to see them this year. I'm really glad that I got to begin to fill in the gap of what business research and development looks like. Many of my conversations being very, very targeted in academic and R&D labs for, you know, there's more people doing that in Maine. So it's easier for me to find them. But this has been just a joy to talk to you. Oh, thank you very much. And I think it's going to get even better with our partnership with the Rue Institute also. I was so happy to have seen them move in, although I don't know that their building fared all that well in the latest storm. Yeah, I think the latest storm was tough for a lot of people. Wendy, it has been a delight to talk to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is executive produced and hosted by me, Kate Dickerson, and edited and produced by Scott Lozell. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.